All right. My name is Carl Frank. It's a pleasure to have you here today. Our topic is year-end planning ideas and tax tips for 2020. Again, please remain in mute and turn your video off until the end of today's presentation. We're going to go about one half hour. Uh, today we're going to have Brett Everhart uh, and Chad Harmon join me in, in talking about some good ideas for the year, end of the year. Uh, allow me to introduce our firm to you one more time. Uh, we're a 34-year-old firm with more than 100 years of combined experience on our team. We're independent and we provide a, uh, an expert team of a CPA, attorney, insurance expert for whoever you might need in your life. And if you have these experts already on your team, we work with them and, and provide a great process for facilitating communication so you don't have to worry about that in your life. We have a patented investment process. We've had seminars this year on that and we're super excited about that and, and we're proud of that. And those of you who are clients will be reading real soon our third quarter investment commentary. I hope you enjoy that. Uh, if you haven't seen it yet, make sure to ask your financial advisor for that. You know, we only work with a small number of successful families for whom we can make a significant impact. And at our firm, we remain full of hum humility and gratitude. Uh, a client this morning described the year 2020 as a dumpster fire of a year. And it's a good time to be very humble and full of gratitude and really remember what means the most to you. So. Uh, we're feeling full of that this year. We're very, very grat very full of gratitude for you and, and your trust in our firm. All right, without further ado, I'm going to introduce our two speakers, uh, Brett Eberhardt and Chad Harmon. They're going to take the lead. You know, Brett is an expert at Social Security and Retirement Income Planning, and Chad, as well, is a Retirement Income Planning expert. I think you're going to enjoy their presentation. And so without further ado, Brett, the floor is yours. Well, right. thank you, you Carl. Me? Let me see if I can get myself to uh, start my video so you can actually see me talk here and go back to the uh, my initial slide. Uh, some of you might be wondering why am I showing our wealth management advanced planning slide and it's basically to bring us all back, you know, we talked about the dumpster fire just now. Uh, bring us all back to the base of what we are here to do for you. Um, and the, the base, as you can see, are the financial plan and the investor behavior. You know, we have an event coming up in a few days called a presidential election. And some of us on the call will be happy. Some of us will not be so happy come November 4th or longer, depending on what happens. <laughs> But anyway, what we want you to remember is what the key to your success is to be following that financial plan and not let short term um, worries, you know, get you out of that plan. That's what we're here to do is to make sure that we that we stay focused on the long term success of what you guys are trying to do and accomplish. So let's get into a little bit of some year end planning ideas. One thing that I recommend people do, and you know, it's, it's sometimes hard. It's, I've got some clients who haven't looked at their will or their trust or their you know, power of attorney for financial items in quite a, a long while. It's been years and years. And sometimes their lives have changed and they, they kind of forget that those are out there. It's very, very important for you to make sure that you know, periodically, and I'm gonna be recommending a year, you know, every year, just kind of make sure that those documents are um, accomplishing what you want today going forward, not what you may have wanted 10 years ago going forward. So please uh, make sure that you look at that. And along those lines, we talk, talk about the healthcare directive. Um, you know, if those of us dealing with uh, elderly parents and things, you know, and, and myself with my family, I want to make sure that should I become incapacitated, that my loved ones know exactly how I want to be treated. So um, make sure that your health care directive um, spells out exactly should you become incapacitated in any way, make sure that it spells out how you want things to progress in that circumstance. It's very, very important. The idea that you have a will or a trust doesn't necessarily mean that that's going to drive every account that you have as far as 
you know, should something happen to you, you know, the, the will or the trust is going to determine where uh, the money goes. And that comes into play in your retirement accounts. If you have an IRA or a 401k, those, those documents have beneficiary pages. The beneficiaries listed on those pages will actually drive where the money goes in those particular accounts. It, if, it's, if it's different than what your will or your trust says, understand that what's going on in the retirement account beneficiary page is where that money goes. I've had circumstances and seen circumstances where uh, there might have been a divorce. Uh, the ex-spouse is still listed on the retirement account and the owner of that account does not want them to receive the money. Well, if something happens to that owner and the ex-spouse is on there, that ex-spouse will receive the percentage that's listed on that beneficiary page. So make sure that your beneficiary designations, not just in your will or trust are, are there, but make sure the ones in your retirement accounts, IRAs, 401ks, are handled correctly. And again, I recommend that, you know, this time of year might be a great time for you to kind of review those things every year. So let's talk about taxes. Tax deferred is tax compounded, or at least it should be. What that statement basically is saying is that if, it's, if, it, hasn't compound, if it hasn't compounded your tax situation, it means that you haven't grown your money in your account. You know, that's what we here at A&I Financial Service are here to do is to help you grow your money. And if it's in some of those uh, retirement accounts, we're actually increasing your tax burden as well when you retire. So, you know, one of the way to, to go about this is to go tax-free as much as possible. We're gonna, Chad's gonna be talking about different uh, methodologies of doing that. And uh, I'm gonna brag a little bit about Carl who opened our presentation today. He does have a book out there and a website called Go Tax Free, which have all kinds of ideas about how to uh, go tax free as much as possible in the future. The gotaxfreebook.com site actually has some uh, 2020 updates uh, that are, may not have made it into the hard copy yet. So I encourage you to at least go to that website and, and look around and see what other information you might glean. So what really happens in retirement, especially with those taxable accounts? Well, my goodness, my distribution was a great big piece of cherry pie. But I only got a small part of it. That's not fair. Again, this, this all goes down to, you know, what we want to do and the reason we have our expert team is to make sure that we work with your CPAs and try to come up with the most efficient approach of receiving your money from your retirement accounts in such a manner that we get a little bit more of that pie than, uh, than this actual picture shows here. Some tax deductions. These are just a few that are out there that are kind of the most common that, um, you know, at least we, we look at. Now, home mortgage interest. Uh, that is currently deductible, but, you know, who knows in the future, you know, with Congress and what's going on there, that that might be something that's reduced. Uh, kids, you know, those that are uh, dependents, you definitely get a good deduction on um, having children there. Business-related uh, type expenses for those that have your own business or are able that you know you incur some business expenses during the year. These can be uh, something that are you know very beneficial to lowering your taxes as you're filing those returns every year. Um, some of the one of the things that you'll have to be cognizant of is the standard deduction versus the business-related expenses, and do kind of an analysis with your um, tax professional to make sure, you know, am I going to have enough to get to that $24,000 for a joint filer this year of the standard deduction. The reason that IRA and 401k contributions is listed here is because a lot of those are considered pre-tax contributions, meaning that it doesn't hit your bottom line of your paycheck. So as those contributions uh, go into your retirement accounts, 
there's less money for them to tax so that um, that's one good way of not only saving for retirement, but also lowering, lowering your tax bill. Again, you know, I've said it before, you know, make sure that you're working with us and your tax, um, tax advisors, your CPAs, et cetera, to make sure that what we're doing is helping you make the most efficient tax plan that you can. So what will the future of tax rates be? You know, will they be lower? Mm, who knows? The same, maybe. Will they be higher? Possibly. Um, you know, these are things that we need to be thinking about. Uh, for instance, if you have a non, uh, non-retirement account, uh, like an individual brokerage account or a joint account, uh, what we're hearing is that there may be some increases with um, long-term capital gain rates. For those in lower tax brackets, around 15 to 18 percent, um, there's discussions going around Capitol Hill that said that that actually might be raised cap they might actually raise capital long-term capital gain rates to the income rates income tax rates so that's something to be aware of and something that we'll definitely uh, be talking about once some of those uh, pictures become a little more clear tax harvesting uh, this is a service that we are very happy to provide to our clients who have taxable accounts. Again, you'll see that last bullet says it's only used in non-qualified. What that means is non-retirement uh, taxable accounts. What tax harvesting does that we do for those accounts that really it makes a big, um, a big advantage for them is that we look at the gains that they've had in their account that have been realized, and then we look at what is sitting out there as far as these holdings go that might have some some losses for the year. What we can do is, is we can offset some of those gains that have been occurring in your account by selling some of these that have a loss associated with them, thereby lowering your ta the tax impact that you'll have by your accounts growing. You may not have to incur all of that growth in taxes. So now what we're going to do is I'm going to turn it over to Chad, and he's got some ideas that um, that we'll be looking at. I'm trying to get him control. That's why I'm stumbling here. There he is. So anyway, Chad's going to give us some ideas on what we might be able to do to lessen that tax burden in the future. Chad, take it away. All right, I appreciate it, Brett, and I hope everyone on the call is hanging in there okay today. Uh, my job's fun. I get to share with you some some concrete examples of how we might be able to to mitigate your tax burden for the remainder of, of 2020. And I have six ideas I'm going to share with you on the call. I will tell you that the content's heavy, so if you uh, are too busy trying to write down notes of the details of these, don't sweat it. Make sure that you follow up with your individual advisor after the call, and we'd be happy to walk through these in detail with you because it is a lot to soak in during a, a short time we have together today. So the first idea I'm going to talk about is just the concept of a Roth IRA. Um, now, in theory, a, a Roth IRA is the exact opposite of a traditional IRA or a 401k account um, in the fact that rather than pre-tax dollars going in, where we're able to get a tax break today, um, this would be utilizing after-tax dollars to fund a Roth. Now, there are a few hurdles we need to take into account, such as income limits and contribution limits. Um, we're only allowed, according to the IRS, to put in $6,000 a year into a Roth IRA. If you're over the age of 50, you'll be able to put in an additional catch-up contribution of $1,000, so a total of seven. Um, however, high-income earners may not be eligible uh, to fund a Roth IRA as we just walked through. Uh, the limit for a single filer is going to be close to $140,000 this year, uh, and that's a little over $200,000 for a married couple. $206,000 um, is the maximum maximum amount of income you could have uh, and still be able to, to fund the Roth IRA. So after tax dollars go into the Roth, we're able to invest it however we see fit. And that growth is going to be sheltered from taxation um, for as many years as it stays in the account. 
Um, once we need the funds to supplement retirement or to make them purchase, we can access those dollars, both the contributions and the growth tax-free. It can be an extremely powerful tool for you moving forward, giving you more choice and control over your taxes. Uh, another benefit I think that is overlooked a lot with Roth IRAs is that they're not subject to required minimum distributions or RMDs. Uh, once we turn 70, uh, the IRS is going to come knocking on our door and say, hey, you know, you, you have money stuffed away in these tax deferred accounts like 401ks and IRAs. Uh, we want to get paid uh, on these dollars you've been sheltering for so long. So they force us to pull money out via an RMD distribution every year. Um, if you have your money in a Roth versus a traditional IRA, you would not be subject to taking those taxable distributions. Um, again, just giving you more choice and control. Um, let's remember that even after the new year, uh, you're still eligible to make contributions to your Roth IRA up until the tax filing deadline. So come February, if you look back and you have some extra cash laying around, and you're eligible, it may make sense to go ahead and, and put in a contribution uh, back for calendar year 2020. And you could even make your 2021 contribution at that time. All right, idea number two. Now we're gonna get into to one step further on the Roth, the Roth conversion. Um, I'm gonna open by having everybody ask themselves the, the following two questions. One, are you over the age of 59 and a half? Or do you have enough money outside of your IRA to pay the taxes on a conversion today? Um, in theory, if you're over 59 and a half and you were to convert your Roth, your, your IRA to a Roth or a portion of it, um, you could use the funds inside the IRA to help with that tax burden. Um, if you're not 59 and a half yet, that would be considered an early withdrawal. So you'd need to have the funds outside either in your bank account or an after-tax investment account to be able to help with the, the tax bill when it comes due. Um, but if either one of these um, sound relevant to you, a Roth conversion could very well be something that benefits your overall retirement plan. So let's walk through what that looks like. Um, when we look at converting uh, an IRA to a Roth, the first thing I want to address is that this is not an all or nothing scenario. Uh, a lot of folks that we meet with have a misconception that they would have to convert their entire IRA to a Roth, and that could be very daunting from a tax standpoint, because as you can see on our bullet points here, there are tax impl implications of converting a Roth IRA. So. Uh, in my example, you have $100,000 in a Roth IRA. We're going to convert $20,000 of it. That $20,000 would be added to my taxable income for the year in which I convert. Um, I want to make sure, and we want to make sure as your advisors, that we're being prudent with your tax bracket situation. So, for instance, if I'm um, a $50,000 earner and I'm in a 12% tax bracket, and as soon as I make $80,000 a year, the IRS says I'm going to jump up tax brackets. If I were to convert more than $30,000, I could very well be converting at a much higher tax rate. And so one thing that we found to be very successful, rather than one fail swoop coming in and, and converting a large chunk of your IRA, this can often be staggered through a very detailed plan um, over many years where there might be years it makes sense to convert a larger amount other years, we might not convert anything at all. So you remain in the driver's seat, keeping control over the amount and the frequency at which something like this would be implemented. Um, again, uh, Roth conversions are not for everybody. Everybody's situation is different. So we want you to talk to your advisor, uh, whether it's Carl or Brett or myself or any of the other great advisors at our firm. Um, ask them you know, to run an analysis for you. See if this makes sense. And if so, we would be more than happy as this, this is right in our wheelhouse of where we uh, can bring some serious value to the table for our, for our clientele. All right. Next up, this is our final Roth topic. We're gonna to talk about a Roth 401k. Um, according to, to a study I saw from CNBC earlier this year, about 63% of 401k plans in America are now offering a Roth 401k option. Um, why is this important? Because it doesn't discriminate against high income earners. Um, those income limits to contribute to a Roth IRA um, are no longer uh, subject to somebody with a Roth 401k. So um, as you're taking a percentage of your paycheck, let's just use 10% as an example, you now may have a choice to put that into a pre-tax 401k. We're able to get a tax deduction today, 
or into a Roth 401k. And the limits as far as contribution for a Roth 401k are much higher, meaning that if a, if a six or $7,000 contribution to a Roth is, again, not going to move the needle for you, um, maxing out a, a 401k into a, a, the Roth side of a 401k plan could very well be impactful. And uh, we can put in $19,500 a year um, opposed to the 7000 into a Roth 401k. If you're over 50, uh, we'll bump that all the way up to $26,000 that you could stuff away, uh, which is a, a massive amount of, of a lot of people's taxable income. So it can definitely make a, an impactful um, uh, move on your overall retirement plan. Now, this option is, is probably easiest for folks um, that are getting paid a large year-end bonus um, if you're looking to implement it in 2020. And the reason why I bring that up is 401k contributions are done via payroll. So if you wait till the last week of December and all of a sudden you want to max out your, your traditional or your Roth 401k, there's not going to be enough income a lot of the time for them to be able to defer into the plan. Um, in that case, we may want to set this up now as a strategy for 2021 that hopefully can have a, a very big impact changing your future moving forward. So um, to close on the Roth option, you can fund a, a regular Roth IRA. Um, you can put money into a Roth 401k, which is going to get rid of those income limits and let you stuff more money away. Um, but the Roth conversion may be the most impactful of the three as uh, there is no dollar limit to the amount we can convert. There is no income limit to the amount we can convert. So regardless of how wealthy an individual is, they could still convert as much of their IRA as they wanted in any given year, regardless of income. All right. Next on the list, I'm going to talk about HSA accounts, health savings accounts. Um, these are a very tax advantaged way for us to shelter income and pay for medical expenses, which oftentimes there's no way uh, to get around them. Most of us are paying something out of pocket year over year, and, and HOA, HSA can be a wonderful way to cover some of these expenses. Um, we do have to consider some contribution limits for the HSAs. Uh, an individual in 2020 can put a little over $3,500 away into an HSA. For a family, it's all the way up to $7,100. Um, they do have a catch-up clause for anybody age 55 and older. Uh, remember the catch-up for, for a retirement account is age 50. For an HSA, it's going to be five years later at age 55. Um, so in theory, a married um, uh, individual over 55 could put uh, $26,000 away into their 401k plan and an additional 8,100 bringing their total uh, to over 34,000 a year of income they can now shelter from taxation, uh, which is pretty powerful. Um, these are pre-tax dollars that go into the plan. Um, they're gonna be invested just like they would inside a 401k plan. We can invest in mutual funds and have exposure to things like the stock market. Um, the growth is going to be tax-free. And as long as we withdraw those funds for eligible medical expenses, and the, the, the scope of those expenses is pretty broad, um, no one will ever pay tax on those dollars. So very, very efficient way to pay for medical expenses. Um, one nice thing about HSA is, is that it's not a use it or lose it scenario. Um, for instance, if, if you're maxing out your HSA plan and you're only using half of those dollars every year, um, the remaining balance is going to continue to defer inside your account, continue to, to um, uh, uh, grow tax-free and compound year over year um, up up into the time you retire and even further further past that. Um, if you are to try to withdraw money uh, for a non-medical expense prior to age 65, you would pay income tax on those dollars as well as a 20% penalty from the IRS. So we do want to make sure that the dollars go, that go in for healthcare do come out for healthcare. Uh, once you reach age 65, you can actually pull those dollars out for any reason, just like you could from an IRA account uh, and not be subject to that 20% penalty, although you would be taxed uh, from an income standpoint if they weren't going towards medical bills. Uh, many of our clients have chosen to, to use funds from their HSA to pay for things like long-term care insurance, even their Medicare Part D premiums. So there's lots of things this money can go towards. Um, you need to talk to your advisor because there are several rules out there. For instance, um, being a, a eligible for a high deductible health care plan. I think in 2020, what that means is that for a family, uh, your deductible would need to be at least $2,800 a year or $1,400 for an individual. Um, 
in order to be eligible for an HSA. And just because you have um, a high deductible plan does not mean uh, it's 100% chance you're eligible for an HSA. So that's something we can work with. Uh, take a look at your situation and see if that's something that makes sense for you. All right, idea number five is gonna be a 529 plan. I know most of the folks on the call are probably familiar with 529 plans. It's a, again, a tax advantaged way for us to pay for our youth's education. Um, contributions that go into the Colorado 529 plan are able to be deducted from your state tax income. So um, right now in Colorado, our state tax rate is 4.63%. So every dollar you put into the 529 plan, you're immediately gonna save that amount from a Colorado state tax standpoint. Uh, the money that goes into the 529 plan, again, uh, you'll see the recurring theme is gonna grow tax-free and we can pull out both the contributions and the gains for uh, um, qualifying expenses related towards education. There is no income limit here. So regardless of your level of wealth, you're, you're able to take advantage of 529 plans. Uh, the limit each year is gonna be $15,000 per, uh, in this case, parent in my example, per beneficiary. So uh, for a married couple, they would be able to give $30,000 into the 529 plan for an unlimited amount of recipients. Um, if you're looking to make a uh, more immediate gift, you can actually fast forward that funding and pay up to five years at a time into the 529 plan. Um, five years at 15,000 means um, a parent, in theory, uh, could each put away $75,000 in one year receive the tax benefit from that now. However, they would not be able to contribute until that five-year clock comes to an end. Um, contributions uh, are gonna qualify for the annual federal gift tax exclusion, which is great. This is gonna help you out with things like estate planning. Um, and there's a lot of questions we get in regards to 529s. Uh, we at a and I have really uh, made a significant effort this year to provide resources for you, our clients, and, and friends of our clients uh, on our website. So please check out our website, go to the 529 section. We have several videos that are gonna outline the ins and outs of how these work and how they might be beneficial for you in your particular situation. All right, lastly, let's talk about gifting. In my eyes, this can be one of the most uh, entertaining topics for us to go over. Um, we do face uh, similar limits to the 529 plans when it comes to, to the federal exemption for gifting. Uh, we can give $15,000 uh, or $30,000 for a married couple per beneficiary for an unlimited amount of beneficiaries. Um, we can do the same five-year average where you could give $75,000 in one chunk uh, without having to file a gift tax return. That does not mean the maximum you could gift is $75,000. If you gift more than the limit, uh, that would require filing a gift tax return, so there's some extra steps to take there. Um, many of our clients have been actively involved with nonprofits, a charity, a church, um, where they're looking to donate on a regular basis. Um, if you gift to charity um, and you're itemizing your deductions on your tax return, um, this could be a, a really impactful gift. So let's, let's walk through an example. Um, if I'm uh, itemizing my deductions and now I make a charitable gift, I can now write that off against my income for the year. However, if I am taking the standard deduction, which many of us now are, I think um, four years ago, about a third of our country was itemizing their taxes. Um, after the, the recent tax uh, changes that, that passed, only about 10% of Americans are now itemizing, so it's a small number of folks, but um, if you are taking the standard deduction, and let's say you have $5,000 of, of um uh, tax deductions that are eligible and you go donate $5,000 to charity, in theory, it would not be saving you any um, from an income tax standpoint. And so we want you to work with your advisor so we can help make sure that the gifts you have are as one, as meaningful as they can be to those organizations, but also give you the maximum tax benefit um, to your bottom line. Uh, there's a general rule of thumb. You can deduct about 50% of your adjusted gross income um, to charity, which is eligible for, eligible for deduction. 
Um, thanks to the CARES Act in 2020, uh, we have a small window where we can actually deduct up to 100% of our adjusted gross income. Um, and we don't know what 2021 is gonna look like yet, but at least for 2020, um, they've, they've kind of doubled uh, the amount of money that we, can, that we can gift and still get credit for, which is great. Um, many of the folks on the call today are over the age of 70 and subject to uh, what we talked about earlier, which is RMD or required minimum distributions. Um, I'm gonna actually use a real life example from this week. I had a long-term client I've worked with for years, um, done a wonderful job you know, accumulating wealth and setting themselves up for success in retirement and they're comfortably living off their pension and social security. Meanwhile, they have a substantial nest egg of tax deferred dollars in, a, in, a, in an IRA account that are now subject to RMDs. So if they don't do anything, they're gonna be forced to pull this money out of their retirement account pay taxes on that income. Um, and then rather than uh, making a monthly contribution to their charity, uh, my advice for them was to use the RMD uh, for their charitable donation. Now we're gifting pre-tax dollars to the charity, which they never have to pay tax on. Um, and those RMDs will no longer be added to the client's taxable income for the year. Um, you can donate up to $100,000 per individual, so a married couple, that'd be $200,000, um, and able to, to gift that um, uh, via your RMD distribution as a qualified charitable distribution is what you'll see that referred to as. Um, there are a lot of things to consider with this. We always recommend talking to a tax professional as well as your advisor here at a and uh, to make sure that we're following all the guidelines regarding quali qualified charitable distributions. But this is something that can be tremendously impactful, not only for your bottom line, uh, come tax season, but for those charities that you hold near and dear to your heart. So um, I'm going to close with that and we're going to open up the discussion uh, for q and I'm sure we're going to get a lot of very educated questions here on the call and both uh, Brett and myself as well as Carl are going to be able to field these and uh, we'll do the best we can to get everybody uh, get their questions answered in a timely fashion here. So uh, appreciate you joining the call. I'm going to go ahead and, and keep quiet for a minute and uh, we'll open up the uh, panel for discussion.